I call that extreme makeover metaphysical edition, that mm. Satan is trying to fool us into thinking that heaven's going to be a bummer. Hi, and welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast. Got a great discussion for you today with Clay Jones about the fear of death and how that drives Christians. I know it sounds like it might be a bit depressing, but I promise it's actually quite a hope-filled conversation. But first, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, and that's the Impact 360 Gen Z Lab, which is your guide to leading the next generation in a post-Christian culture. So Gen Z Lab exists to spark conversation for leaders around challenges and the opportunities for presented in ministering to Gen Z, which is that group of, you know, 18, 19, 20 and under. So Gen Z Lab is a conversation with today's leading experts on these issues regarding Gen Z and the next generation. So you'll get access to hours of exclusive video content from people like Jonathan Morrow, Sean McDowell, Christopher Yuan. Uh, there's actually a discussion I have in the Gen Z Lab on doubt, but also you'll get access to a private Facebook group for discussions and you'll get encouragement with other Gen Z leaders. So you can go to impact360.org to learn more. My guest today is Clay Jones. Uh, he's been on the show before to talk about his book, Why Does God Allow Evil?, which is a phenomenal resource. So definitely go back and listen to that episode, or better yet, just get the book and read it. Uh, but he's just written a new book called Immortal, How the Fear of Death Drives Us and What We Can Do About It. So Clay, I'm so glad that you're back on the show. Uh, it's been a little while, but your work tends to focus on kind of darker topics. So you've written a book on evil and uh, you had to study genocide and war and you've written fairly extensively on the Canaanite conquest and on slavery. And so uh, your new book is about death. <laughs> so <laughs> what, what led you to write a book about death? You know, it's funny, just before I mentioned that, it's interesting because I, I've written a book on evil and then death, and I'm writing now, hopefully, a, a book on suffering. Uh, and I think sometimes people go, wow, you, that must be really dark for you. It's not at all, yeah. because as you understand what God's doing in the larger universe, uh, it, it just all it just helps it make sense to me. And I see that God, for instance, God uses suffering for our good. Yeah. And I just did a blog on the first blog on that this morning, as a matter of fact, at claytones.net. But anyway, the reason how I got into the book is uh, I was reading uh, uh, something by a Paris philosopher named Luke Ferretti. And Luke uh, Ferretti says, well, he says, all of philosophy is about handling death, is about how we can cope with death uh, without God. And I thought, what on earth is he talking about? Really? All of philosophy is about handling death without God. And I, I almost couldn't believe it. I mean, it just seemed too, too amazing to me. And so I started looking up the people he was, that he referenced, like Plato, uh, Mich Michel de Montaigne, uh, Schopenhauer, uh, and on and on and on. And indeed, they all basically said yes. Uh, in fact, Plato said uh, that doing philosophy a right is learning to die easily. Mm. Well, when I came on that, I thought, man, I've got to get it. What in the world? How do people handle death without God? Mm. And of course, I know how we handle death with God, but I wanted to say, how do we handle death without God? And so anyway, I started reading psychologists and sociologists and anthropologists, philosophers on what their answers were to death. And uh, uh, a lot of them, you know, the very last sentence of their book is always fascinating to me because uh, mostly their cupboards are just completely bare. But anyway, so that's what caused me to get into the book. Well, that's really interesting that that you would bring about all of these kind of darker topics, but how you actually find so much hope in those things because yeah. the Christian answer explains those things so meaningfully. But just as I was preparing for this interview, I just Googled, you know, how to get over the fear of death or something like that. And so just about the first article that came up just listed all of these really earthly and practical things like, you know, take control of your life and learn to accept that death is natural and, uh, you know, read self-help books about death. And I'm just going, that is the most hopeless answer I could possibly <laughs> imagine. Because if I'm truly afraid of death, accepting that it's natural doesn't 
change my fear. It doesn't do anything to help me, right? It's just like, how am I supposed to do that? Exactly, exactly. In fact, let me, Alex Rosenberg, who's an atheist philosopher at Duke, wrote a book entitled The Atheist Guide to Reality, uh, Enjoying Life Without Illusion. Uh, And he disagreed. He says, Epicurus wasn't right when he said that understanding the nature of reality is by itself enough to make a person happy. He says, now here's the very last sentence of this atheist philosopher, Alex Rosenbuch's uh, book. I'm always fascinated by the last sentence, and here it is. Take a Prozac or your favorite serotonin reuptake inhibitor and keep taking them until they kick in. In other words, Alex Rosenberg, his answer to dealing with death is get high, use drugs. And I, to me, that was just, that's just phenomenally interesting. That's all you got. And that really is, uh, he, he's not the only one. Other people are saying uh, magic mushrooms is showing a lot of project <laughs> promise for people. Wow. Uh, and I just sit there and I go, really? Uh, we're going to be using magic mushrooms and we're going to be, you know, I mean, taking all kinds of drugs and just get high. Uh, wow. And, but it, so, like I say, the last sentence is fascinating. What do they got? They got nothing. nothing yeah. So, well, and there, I think there's something um, about <clears throat> coming face to face with death that changes you. I think that often, if, if you haven't really encountered death, you can tend to think of it more as an abstract concept. I know that certainly was true for me. I I didn't really have any kind of meaningful interactions with death uh, other than my grandparents, which felt more natural and they were older and you're kind of expecting it. But it really wasn't until my family walked through the death of my nephew just this past year at 21 years old that everything about death really became real to me. And it it really changed me forever. In fact, uh, I want to get into this a little bit later. I don't want to get into it too much now because I want to lay the foundation for some of this, but I was always afraid of when my parents would die. Like this was just a, a deep fear. What, what do I do? Who do I call? Like how, how do we even get through something like that? But then walking through this experience uh, brought so much healing to a lot of that, so much peace because of the meaningful answer that God gives to death. And, and so I would imagine that in your research, you came across a lot of interesting interesting information just from p- people's stories and, and the way people have faced death and the fears that have come out of that. So when it comes to fearing death, what did you discover? I, you know, How much do people actually fear their deaths? And I guess we could answer this question both among Christians and just the world at large. Uh, my, my, the answer to that is people are... <clears throat> terrified by death. Uh, in fact, uh, three psychology professors at different universities uh, have gotten together and have written on this extensively. And they've done over 500 studies have been conducted on how people fear death. Uh, and the answer is when people are actually confronted by their death, uh, it just horrifies them and terrifies them. It, when you talk to people, though, like I'd be telling people I was writing a book about death, uh, the fear of death, people would say to me something like, well, I don't almost blurt it out immediately. I don't fear death. And just boom, there it is. I don't fear death. And as I put in the book, I say, and, and they're not they're not being entirely dishonest because they don't think about their deaths. In fact, they don't think about their deaths at all. They don't not at all. Uh, it's until they find a lump somewhere uh, or they have a pet chest pain or, uh, you know, a, a positive comes back on a blood test. Then death stands in front of them and won't leave the room. I mean, it's it's there. Um, and uh, in study after study, uh, they've done they've when they've introduced people to their fear of death, it makes them it changes their behavior radically. So the but most people are are, are denying that they're going to die and then distracting themselves. Mm. Uh, and so you've got you know that's why by the way people go well why do we pay sports and singing and movie stars so much money because they're the most valuable people in the world. And what I mean by that is uh, they keep us from thinking about the fact that we're going to die. Wow, and yeah. so they're doing the <laughs> they're doing the most important thing in the world for us. It gives us entertaining. It amuses us, makes us stop thinking about our ultimate destination. Julia Louis-Dreyfus, you know, the Veep and Seinfeld star, yeah. she's, she got a call the day after she won an Emmy for Best Actress and Director of Veep. Uh, she got a call saying that she had breast cancer. And she said she hysterical or she says howling laughter turned into hysterical crying. And as you read what she says, she says, you know, we don't think about death ever. And then she says hardly ever. 
but it's really a fact and it's something to deal with. And see, so most people are pushing it out of their minds as much as they can, but when it confronts them, it's terrifying to them. Mm. And I think a lot of people are more terrified right now because death is more real to them because of this COVID virus. Yes, that's a good point because everybody's sort of having to face the reality that, you know, any one of us could get this. And it seems random, at least, I don't know when this episode's gonna air, but at least where we're at right now, you know, at first they were saying, well, it doesn't affect younger people, but yet I personally know a couple of younger people who nearly died from it. And so yeah. it's 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 sort of this unknown kind of thing. And, and that's an interesting point about how we're all distracting ourselves from it. It's like the whole phenomenon of the Netflix binge, you know, it sort of oh, yeah. pushes away those thoughts of, of death and, and what's really coming. In fact, you and I, um, when we were together for the Biola on the Road conference, I remember you said to me when you were sort of summing up your book, you said, I can know nothing about you, but the one thing I know about you is that yeah. you're going to die. <clears throat> and that's really true. True, isn't it? We know that about every single person. And In fact, I was just going to say, absolutely. In fact, the only thing you know for sure about your future is that you're going to die. Mm. And what I mean is you say, oh, no, I'm going to have lunch. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have lunch after this. Uh, not necessarily. Right. I mean, most likely, right, or whatever. Most likely. Actually, you're in a different time zone than I am. But but, but the truth of the matter is uh, you don't know that for certain. Yeah. You don't know if, a, if something's going to, a plane's going to fly out, fall out of the sky on top of your house. This happened not long ago here in, in Southern California. Yeah. You don't know that for sure, but you do know you're going to die. And I sit there and I tell people, I think, you know what? We Christians should be comfortable with the only thing we know about our lives for sure, and that is the way we're going to die. But non-Christians, by the way, deal with death in three different major ways, literal immortality projects, and then symbolic immortality projects, and then they also deal with it in the, well, atheists deal with it in what I call mortality mitigating projects, but they're trying to do something mm. to transcend their deaths because it scares the crud out of them, and they think if they can live on in some way that that's going to be the, their, their answer. Yeah. Well, your title states that the fear of death drives people. So can you expand on that a little bit more? What do you mean by that, that the fear of death drives people? Well, it, you know, for instance, it, it take literal immortality projects. Why do you think people are so consumed with going to the gym, uh, uh, running miles, uh, going to Whole Foods and making sure they're, that it's non-GMO uh, and, and on and on and on? Uh, they're, they're trying to live as long as they possibly can with the hope that science is going to do what it's supposed to do finally and, when, and, and cure what might kill them. That's their hope. And in fact, uh, Sean Parker, the first president of Facebook, he actually said straight out, he says, uh, I expect to live because I'm going to a billionaire and I bet I'm going to have better health care. I expect to live at least to 160 and then to just be able to go on and coast into immortality, because if I can live to 160, then, you know, they'll, of course, have figured it all out. Wow. Well, and, and and the founder of Bullet Coffee is saying the same thing. He's expecting to live forever. Wow. Uh, but. This is not, I mean, there's a lot of misunderstanding. People are not living longer. They think they're living longer, but they're not because mortality rate has gone up. But that's only because of inf infant mortality has gone down. Uh, uh, in other words, they, you know, it's like 17% of infants died within the first year. Uh, and so that made it so people look like, oh, wow, people are dying at 49. At, at the turn of the last century, it was about 49 years old. Now it's about 78 and a half. Well, but that's only be, that's not because of science, really, except for it's changed infant mortality. Uh, we're not living longer. In fact, one more weird factoid. If they cured every form of cancer, every one of them, all of them, Nathan Kiefitz, a Harvard demographer, concluded in a study. This is not this isn't guesswork. This isn't an estimate. Uh, this is a calculation. He said the Americans would only live 2.265 years longer if they cured every single form of cancer and there was no cancer in the world left. Really? People, if you think you're going to live longer, uh, literally, uh, you're not. Wow. And you mentioned also in your book, I'm trying to remember this example about the man that ate healthy and he was a runner. And tell, oh, yeah. tell us about Jim, that one. Jim Fix, for instance, yeah. died very, very young. Uh, I could go, I mean, uh, one after another, Jerome Rodale, who was the founder of Prevention Magazine, went on the Dick, Cav he was 70 years old. He went on the Dick Cavett show to 
proclaim to the world uh, that he wasn't going to die before 100 years old unless it was by accident. And so he's interviewed on the Dick Cavett show and he's sitting there and Dick Cavett looks at him and says, is something wrong? In fact, he says, are we boring you, Mr. Rodale? Because Mr. Because Rodale started looking kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> and it turned out that Rodale had a heart attack and died during the interview on Dick Cavett. Wow. He died wow. in the interview. Uh, I mean, uh, so people... You know, and one health food expert after another, the Pritikin, the founder of the Pritikin diet, actually slashed his wrists at laying in a hospital bed and slashed his wrists at 69 years old because he was dying of leukemia. Mm -hmm. And I could go, the book goes on and on. I document yeah. a lot of these. But if you're trusting in health food, it's not going to save you. It yeah. isn't. You might live a little longer. And you might live a little better, but if you think you're going to live a lot longer, and what, one of the things that all these people, in my opinion, had in common is that they were trusting in health, food, and diet and exercise to save them, and it's not going to save them. Well, that, uh, one thing that is just, Lord, the marker of your books is just the the deep research that you do. I mean, especially that stood out to me with your last book, um, Why Does God Allow Evil? Just all of the different historical examples and, and all of this. Just as a little side note, how long did you research for this book? Uh, you know, how what, what, what did that research process look like for you? Well, thankfully, it turns out, I didn't know this when I was in high school, but it turns out I love research. I just love it. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a blast. Uh, and I've learned, you know, I can go very quickly through books. Uh, I, I don't, you know, I mean, the average book that I pick up, I've probably done within an hour or two wow. uh, because I go for exactly what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And I have a shelf behind me. Uh, I can't really show it to you, but I've got a shelf behind me of books on how people handle death. Uh, but I just love it. And so I'll, I just read one thing after another, after another, after another. And of course, those, I'd read one thing and it would mention another book. And so I'd go reading that book and it would re mention somebody else. And, and, uh, but I just, I, I enjoy it. I, I can read very quickly and I don't, I, I rarely read an entire book cover to cover uh, because if I did that, I wouldn't get through very many books. I, yeah. I'm, I've learned to hunt down where is it that they talk about death? In fact, I'd often, like I say, I've been particularly interested in the last page of books on, you know, how to live without fearing death. Yeah. And as I said with that Alex Rosenberg, the last sentence was use drugs because <laughs> yeah. that's how you're going to feel better. So you need so your next book needs to be how to research a book <laughs> because I uh, feel like I would find all of that like those tips very useful on how to just dig for what you you're looking for and in a in a quicker way so just you know free idea from me for your next book yeah, to <laughs> yeah, thank you you know I've taught apologetics research and writing for 16 years yeah. now at Talbot yeah. Six, uh, that's everybody's had to take it that enters our program and I've taught research and writing. I'm going to give you, here's a tip for everybody. Okay. If you're, if you're wondering if a book might, a particular book might help you go to Amazon, don't click on the Kindle version, click on the paperback or how hardbound version and use search inside. And then, cause it's got the search inside option and then put the keywords in there and see what it's got. It's amazing how ah. many books you can go through by just using search inside a book on Amazon. Wow, that's a very good, good tip for, for us, because uh, I'm, I'm thinking about my next book, and I've already got the concept, but now I'm thinking about the mountain of research that I'm going to have to do, so I'm going to use some of these tips. Um, but back to your book, so you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago something you called li uh, literal immortality projects. So yeah. what what is that? Can you expand on that a little bit? Well, people are trying to literally live forever. Uh as one woman, you know, put it, she says, you know, it's wanting to live forever is what causes us to uh, work, get up and run at, you know, 6 a.m. on a Monday morning uh, and eat all and force kale down our throats. Uh, and then she, her next sentence was, and, and to show our genitals to a gynecologist, if we think something's a little bit off, why are we doing this? Uh, because we want to live forever and we want to live literally forever. Uh, and uh, or as long as possible, people are afraid of it. But then you've got also scientific 
You've got brain uploading, uh, which is just never going to happen. We could get off into that, but it's not going to happen. There's a lot but of a movies lot of... about that right now. I've noticed okay. like TV shows and movies where that sort of oh, concept huge. yeah, is is really popular. In, in We're going to upload our consciousness. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there's there's a, an Amazon series coming out on uploading your brain. Uh, it's That's just crazy town, but that's not going to happen ever. And, and I give reasons for that in my book. Computers will never become conscious. Uh, the best scientists in the world that aren't Christians, they, they like David Chalmers, he says, we don't know what consciousness even is in a human, much less how yeah. it would get into a machine. And he actually believes in brain uploading. He says, but we don't have any idea how it works. Mm. Well, you know, for us Christians, we don't believe this is even remotely possible because we believe that we have souls that are non-material. Well, if, you, if souls are immaterial, uh, you can't upload them right. into a machine. Yeah. So by the way, so people, a lot of people's answers to this is cr that they're going to be frozen. They're going to be cryonically frozen. And Simon Cowell and Seth MacFarlane and Larry King all intend to be frozen. They're going to be kept in liquid nitrogen fats at Alcor. Well, wow. That's, you know, how's that going to work? You're going to be frozen at 476 degrees below zero Fahrenheit? I mean, that's crazy town. And and one of, well, I'll just give you the, one of the biggest problems with it. And if you go to Alcor's website in uh, Tucson, mm -hmm. uh, or rather Scottsdale, uh, is when they freeze people, uh, they have, they all experience, every one of them experience what Alcor calls acoustic fracturing events. And that's the same phenomenon. And this says it on their website, same phenomenon is if you put ice in a diet in a warm diet coke and you hear this crack 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 oh. that happens to your brain oh, that happens to your organs they shatter yeah. and and but we think we think we're going to bring these people back we're yeah. not going to bring them back they are not coming back uh they're yeah. going it's, it'd be like frankenstein's monster it's not i could give many other reasons but it's simply not going to happen but as larry king put it he says that's the only glimmer of hope that i have wow so why is it stupid? Maybe they'll figure it out and bring me back. Well, uh, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Well, you also mention in your book what you call symbolic immortality projects. So what's a symbolic mm -hmm. immortality project? And, and why do you argue that there's something wrong with that as well? That's, that's not well, a good thing. <laughs> I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that every single one of the people viewing this, pro viewing this uh, podcast have a symbolic immortality project. Every one of them are in, in somewhat engaged in symbolic immortality projects. And a symbolic immortality project is just there's some way that I'm going to live on past my death. <clears throat> I'll give you an example. Having children is a symbolic immortality project. Philosophers like Plato, he says, he says, this is the way people live on. Einstein said, this is the way we live on. We live on through our children. I don't think a lot of people necessarily state it that clearly, but that is what they think, that they're going to live on through their children. Uh, writing a book, uh, doing, you know, I, it's not lost on me, but I, as I tell people, I say, I try to remember the audience of one mm. uh, because, uh, but, but yeah, sure, that can be a symbolic immortality project. Saving the planet. I, what are you doing with your life? I'm saving the planet. I mean, from, uh, you know, I mean, and, and thus, that's why people get so enraged if you get in the way of their symbolic immortality project, because you're killing them a second time. Oh, yeah. You're killing their potential immortality. By the way, uh, that's why, uh, you know, with children, you aren't going to live on through your children, everybody. Bad news. Uh, after 20 generations, there is not enough of your genes in you in the, your uh, 20 generations from you to feed a mosquito. In fact, there might not be any of your genes in offspring 20 generations away. None, because genes transfer over in groups. And also, I've, I, I've always liked to ask my students, I'll say, how many of you know the name? Raise your hand if you know the name of your great, great grandparents. Uh, I think not more than two students in all the classes I've asked have been able to say, I know the name yeah. of my great, great grandparents. And then I follow up with this question. I say, 
Do you care? <laughs> no one has ever cared, yeah. ever. They don't care about the names of their great, great grandparents. And uh, I, I think that's uh, one woman, one 20 something young woman says, she says, well, I'm glad they got together. <laughs> yeah. I get that. But that's about it. Yeah. Uh, this is there's there's no future there. But people are trying to do stuff, but it's not going to work. You're yeah. going to be dead. Uh, yeah, your offspring may go on in some sense. And yeah, you might become a famous celebrity, but in a few, in a few decades, uh, and I find this already cause I like to use sports stars and movie stars mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, scenes from movies. I'll ask people, I'll mention various movies. Nobody knows who they are. And frankly, they don't care. Uh, in a few generations, no one will know who Kim Kardashian was and they won't care. Nobody's going to know who these famous actors and actresses were except for a footnote. But see, I think they're thinking, yeah, but at least I'll be a footnote. So in some sense, I go on. Nobody cares. Yeah. But Jesus offers true immortality. Yeah. And if you're in Jesus, you can live forever and ever and ever. And you can live forever and ever and ever with your loved ones who are Christians forever. That's the real answer. But symbolic immortality is not going to work for you ever. It's not going to work for anybody. Well, and you just hinted at the, the Christian answer, which, you know, you almost have to, you have to give all the bad news in order for the good news to really pack a punch, for people to really understand why the good news is good news. And so we sort of laid this sort of bleak foundation of you're all going right. to die. And, you know, 20 years from now, nobody's going to care who you are, even if you're a celebrity, most likely, um, you know, and even if they do remember you, you're not going to be around to, to know that or to appreciate that in any kind of way. Um, so in a moment, we're going to get to the Christian answer for the fear of death, because this is kind of what, what we lay this foundation for. This is what everybody wants to know. Right. Um, and, and, but, but I want to talk about the atheist response oh, for yes. just a second, because there's such an interesting mm. difference in how atheists view death and how Christians view death. I remember watching an interview with Jay Werner Wallace. I think uh, it was on some, I don't know, like CBN or some kind of show where they did a, a big thing on him. And he said something that really kind of made me curious. This is when I was first kind of introduced to his ministry and his work, because I think I had always assumed that if someone's an atheist, there's just, you know, they couldn't possibly have any kind of hope or joy about death at all. But he said that as an atheist, he was perfectly content to believe that when he died, he would go into the ground, that would be it, lights out, he would just cease to exist. And I've met some atheists who, <clears throat> who say that. Um, and I suppose there are some that, that share that feeling, but Again, you've done so much research on this. What have you discovered about how atheists handle this topic? How do atheists resolve their fear of death? Well, atheists use what I call uh, mortality mitigation projects. First of all, I should say at the outset, most atheists have symbolic immortality projects going on. Right. Richard Dawkins does. He sure. says straight out that writing books and literature and doing things like this that we can pass on. Uh, most atheists, uh, you know, the, the fellow uh, Sh Michael Shermer, the founder of Skeptic Magazine, uh, he says, you know, we can live on through our children. We can live on through writing books and doing things. Uh, they'll say that. Uh, so they, that's one thing, but then what they'll do is they'll say, but they have a whole bunch of them. I'll just list a couple of them real quickly. For instance, they, they'll say, well, you wouldn't want to live forever anyway, because, uh, we get used to think our likes wear out sooner or later as we've experienced anything, we wouldn't want to live on forever anyway, but that's assuming that you're going to live on in planet earth. Uh, and also as a non Christian, uh, of course, you're not going to find fulfillment in this earth because, as Jesus said, you drink the, this water, you'll thirst again. It's only if you drink the water that I give you. Uh, so, you know, I think they're partially right when the, they're always going to be singing the Rolling Stones refrain, I can't get no satisfaction. Yeah. And so they go, well, why would I want to live on in a world where I can't get any satisfaction? But in Jesus, uh, we can get satisfaction. I love having dinner with friends. I love having dinner. I like eating. Uh, I like doing these things. And I, but, and I'd look forward to doing them forever. Heaven is most often compared to a banquet. But so anyway, one of the, their favorites is you wouldn't want to live forever anyway, which I think is the big, the most uh, egregious example of sour grapes in the history of the mm -hmm. world, uh, maybe in the history of the universe. Yeah, you wouldn't want to live on forever anyway. Uh, I think that's just crazy town. Uh, Einstein, following Schopenhauer, said we need to learn that our existence is a delusion. Uh, see, this is Buddhist, and a lot of these people, including Sam Harris, 
uh, are engaging in Buddhism. Sam, atheist Sam Harris, like I say, Einstein, Arthur Schopenhauer, all but said, you've got to realize, you've got to learn that your individual existence is, is a delusion. Well, that's dumb. You're in, you're, anyway, this is what, this is the kinds of things they offer. It, it, now, it doesn't work. As I just quoted you with Alex Rosenberg, who's an atheist at Duke, he says, this stuff doesn't work. He says, take drugs. That works. And, uh, and more and more people are following his lead. It, this other stuff, it doesn't work. And by the way, and I quote an atheist in my book on this, there's an atheist who says uh, straight out, he says, atheists have higher rates of suicide than those, than, than those who are religious do. Wow. And uh, I quote a study on that, and it's true. Atheists have a tendency to take their lives more than, more than uh, Christians, uh, more than not just Christians, but religious believers. And uh, so it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't work for them as much as they'd like to hope or think that it works. It doesn't work. And I think the thing about people like Jim, in fact, I, I've got a blog that's waiting to go on this. Uh, Sean McDowell sent me uh, a, a video uh, reference or sent me a link to a video about this atheist uh, who was an, uh, a, a, a philosopher at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and wrote books, actually wrote a book on, on how you didn't need to fear death. Uh, so there he is being interviewed on camera in his 90s, and he said, I wish I'd never written that book. It's not true. The advice isn't true. It doesn't work. I think it's fine for, uh, well, you know, when you're a younger atheist to go, I'm not bothered about it. Yeah. I'm good. It doesn't matter. When all of a sudden it's right, like in your face. Mm -hmm. No, I, I th and I think, frankly, Jim, uh, I think that when it was confronting him dead on, I don't think that he would be going, oh, yeah, well, I'm an atheist and I figured it out and we're good. Atheists don't, when you really talk to them, Sam Harris says, oh, yeah, I have trouble with death. Irving psychiatrist uh, professor, psychiatry professor Irving Yalom at, uh, from Stanford says death is troubling. And these guys are atheists. And they just go, let's just be honest here. This is not like we're going to be, I'm OK with it. That's what you say when you're young and you're not thinking about it. Yeah. When you start to really, when it confronts you, no, that's or not Or when you're work. just simply ignoring the reality of what all of that actually means. That's because right. Because I've known atheists who just say, yeah, I'm fine with it. It's just, I'm going to cease to exist. It'll just, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you really think about that, then why, why even live another five minutes? I mean, in the scheme of how long you're going to cease to exist, what does it that's even right. matter? And uh, that's why those, that kind of, those notions wouldn't work for me because I would go to a very dark place of nihilism like super fast if I if I allowed myself to go there. And and which which is interesting because you mentioned the afterlife a little bit earlier. And I mentioned that I had Googled that article about, you know, how to get over your fear of death. And it was from a secular perspective, of course, and they're saying read self-help books and do all that. There was no mention of the afterlife. There was like a very vague mention of spirituality, like maybe discover some kind of spirituality or something like that. But you know, of course, atheists have rejected the idea of the afterlife for the most part. But also many others who might not even identify as an atheist have, if not, you know, categorically denied the category of an afterlife, they at least live as if there's not one or they, they just don't know or they don't really think about it too much. But how how is the rejection of that belief hurting society? When, when society says there's no afterlife, how is that harmful? How is that hurting us? Well, boy, I'll tell you, it's hurting us in a multitude of ways. And, and uh, well, as I go through the, my book, uh, the, first of all, we engage in denial. Uh, I'm not going to die. It's going to be or I'm not I'm not going to think about dying. I'm just going to push it out of the mind. Of course, denial doesn't work without distraction. You know, the old joke, the only way you can not think about when somebody says, whatever you do for the next 60 seconds, don't think about pink elephants. <laughs> well, everybody, everybody knows the answer to that. The answer is think about blue elephants. You know, you change, you know, I mean, because yeah. uh, otherwise uh, you, you just can't do it. Um, and so denial, they distract themselves. Like I say, that's why entertainment, sports stars, movie stars, TV shows, Netflix, you, YouTube, on and on and on. We need to distract ourselves and keep ourselves off from it. The trouble is, though, this doesn't really work. Thus, depression, of course, depression is getting people uh, terribly, I mean, striking them. Um, in fact, uh, Jordan Peterson, who's gotten very popular with a lot of conservatives, yeah. he says, you know, he says, he says, I'm not surprised when somebody comes to me full of anxiety. He says, 
What really surprises me is periods of calm. That's what I don't understand. Mm. He says the reason that everybody's full of anxiety is self-evident. Just look at the world around you. We're all going to, you know, he doesn't say we're all going to die, but he certainly thinks that that's, says in other places that that's part of it. Uh, so, of course, people are depressed. Of course, they're having to use all kinds of drugs and alcohol to you know, compensate for the depression of the fact that they know they're going to die. As the psychology professors, Shel Solomon and and a lot of names, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to, I can't remember them offhand. But anyway, as I said, if we were constantly faced with the fact of our death, we would be uh, rendered just simply quivering blobs of biological protoplasm, completely unable to deal with uh, the world as we know it. And I think that's true. And so, and then anarchy. Uh, if there's no God, do what you want, uh, because there's nothing stopping you. In fact, by the way, so depression, not only that, but neurosis and psychosis. In fact, it's interesting because uh, the psychology professors, and this was fascinating to me, said the people that neur neurotics are those who see the world too too accurately. In other words, they recognize that they're going to die and their lies about the world because everyone, if you're not a Christian, everyone's having to tell themselves a lie about the nature of reality. Yeah. Uh, but here's a, here's a, I got a, one quick quote from Bertrand Russell, atheist Bertrand Russell. He says, here's though, if you look at it and you mentioned nihilism, listen to Bertrand Russell. He says, all the labors of the ages all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system, and the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. <laughs> yeah. Well, have a nice day with that, yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. pass, pass the fentanyl. Because, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, no wonder people are abusing drugs and frankly, killing themselves. People go, you mean people are committing suicide because they're afraid of dying? Oh, pro they probably would never commit suicide if yeah. they weren't afraid of dying. As psychiatrist Irving Yalom puts it, he says, uh, suicide allows you to control that which controls you. Wow. You can be in charge of when and how you will die. And so, of course, suicide is the answer for a lot of people. But ultimately, of course, uh, this just ends in just immense depression and suicide. And But then, of course, there's the judgment. We're all yeah. going to face the judgment, and that's not going to be good. You don't want to be there when it comes to the judgment of the wicked. So this is simply not, none of this is going to succeed. And I go into much more on how these, 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 all of these things ultimately fail us. And that's why people are incredibly depressed and uh, using all kinds of drugs and alcohol and entertaining themselves endlessly. Why? Yeah. Because they're afraid of dying. Well, I think that's such a great point about the distractions and the drugs and all of the ways that people will sort of trick themselves into not really thinking very deeply about this. And as you were talking about uh, nihilism, it was interesting. I was listening to a podcast of a, a popular Christian music uh, guy, a singer, who had deconstructed and is now an atheist. And he's, um, you know, just completely repudiated any belief in God and Christianity and was even talking on this podcast about how he now finds nihilism beautiful and he can see beauty in it, which to me is is really ironic because you have to actually change the definition of nihilism to find beauty in it because by its very definition to find it beautiful, it's not nihilism anymore. And yeah, so that's right. it's, it's, like, it's like just putting up whatever obstacles they can to not fully think about it. Um, so, so we're going to move now into the Christian response. <clears throat> and you, you mentioned in your book that a lot of Christians fear death. And this is interesting because as I kind of mentioned earlier, I wouldn't say I've ever encountered an overwhelming fear of my own death. I've had fears of uh, living forever. I've had fears about the unknown of what heaven's going to be like or, or something like that. But I've certainly, like I said, had deep fears about loved ones dying. And sure. I, I suspect all of that's probably tied up in the same source. Uh, but why do you think that so many Christians fear death? Because if, if anybody should not fear death, it should be us. So why do you think so many Christians do? Well, that's a that's that's really the sixty four thousand dollar question, uh, and the answer to that actually is really obvious to me. Uh, in fact, I blog on it again. This, this is one of the things I'm blogging on regarding the uh, coronavirus this morning at ClayJones.net. Uh, because one, a lot of Christians are in love with this present world. That's the first major problem. If you're in love with this world, uh, you're not going to want to see it go away, and that's just about as simple as it can be. 
But John says in 1 John, do not love the world or the things of the world, for if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father will not be in him. It's easy for us to love this present world, and that's why the, this virus, the coronavirus or COVID-19 or whatever you want to call it, uh, that's why this is actually helpful to Christians because it's shaking, it's unsettling their worldliness. Yeah. So that's one thing. Another thing is some Christians, a lot of Christians have not are not keeping a clear conscience. Uh, and if you're not keeping a clear conscience, you're not really wanting to get face to face with the creator of the universe, even if you're going to be saved. You don't, you know, I mean, it's, it's an uncomfortable feeling. You know, you've got some business taken care of. Uh, but here's the biggest reason of all. And if I could impart anything to your viewers, uh, Elisa, it would be this. We need, all of us Christians, need to have a robust view of eternal life in Jesus, and very, 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 very few Christians do. Uh, and that's why in my book, Why God Allows Evil, Why Does God Allow Evil, I've, the last three chapters are about heaven, trying to restore. We're not going to be sitting on clouds, play, strumming harps and sporting flightless wings and doing that forever. That's Satan's work. I call that extreme mm. makeover metaphysical edition, mm. that Satan is trying to fool us into thinking that heaven's going to be a bummer. Yeah. Your occupation in heaven is reigning with Christ. And then, and by the way, heaven is most often compared to in Scripture in the Old and New Testament as a banquet. That's what it's most often compared to as a banquet. Uh, but our occupation is going to be reigning with Christ forever and ever. Uh, and in this, in my next, in this book, Immortal: how, how the Fear of Death Drives Us and What We Can Do About It, uh, the, 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 I start. I deal with heaven again. The last couple of chapters. Well, I, I give a chapter on the resurrection because that's our hope. Jesus was raised from the dead. This is a fact of history, folks. Uh, and so I do a chapter. My best argument. I teach in defense of the resurrection, by the way, at, at Talbot, but. Uh, so I'd have my one my one chapter to make that argument. Then I talk about how we need to start focusing on the glory that awaits us in heaven forever. Uh, Peter says in First Peter, gird up your minds for action, be self-controlled, and it's not those and set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. The gird up it's but that's not three commands. It's gird up your minds for action and be self-controlled so that you can mm. set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. In other words, where our hope needs to be is not on 401ks, which are in some trouble right now. It's not on our kids being successful and wonderful and remembering us forever, although that's a lot of genealogy research, right? I'm going to have my kids are going to be able to remember me, and I'm a family historian. Uh, or, you know, our hope needs to be set on the glory that awaits us in heaven forever. And I encourage all everyone that's listening to this, watching this, I encourage you. I pray Ephesians 1, 17 through 19 regularly, and it is that the Lord would give us a spirit. Paul prays that the Lord would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in our knowledge of him, that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, that we would know the hope that we've been called to. I find seven hopes in scripture. The riches of our glorious inheritance, we're inheriting it all, and the surpassingly great power that's at work for us who believe. I've been praying that since 1982. Wow. Uh, and I just... I, we need a robust view of eternal life in Jesus. Very few Christians have it. For most Christians, uh, heaven is an also ran doctrine. It's no, we live the American dream to the fullest. We have a lot of fun. We have lots of healthy kids. And then, yeah, sure, when we die, there's that heaven thing coming. Right. No, 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 no. Heaven's the main event. Heaven's what it's all about. And so this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, Paul said in 1 Corinthians. And anyway, Alisa, if I could communicate anything uh, to those watching this, I that's it. Yeah. We need to change our view of heaven. And by the way, again, one of the things that this virus is doing is it's threatening our worldliness. And the Christian response to that needs to be we need to look to heaven. Yes. And and, right. and eternity. And we need to have a renew. And I encourage people to look at my stuff on eternity because I think it'll help you. My students say, you know, when, since I read that, I now have a more positive outlook, a much more positive outlook on eternity. Because right now, people have a, and like I say, this is Satan's work, think they're going to be sitting on clouds, strumming harps, and singing forever. We're not, by the way, going to be singing forever. That's not what the scripture teaches. Well, the, the book is out now. It's called Immortal, How the Fear of Death Drives Us and What We Can Do About It. So Clay, is there any question I, I should have asked you? What, what did I not ask you that you would like to answer right now for well, those I, who are watching? I, 
I think you've done a great job in covering all the bases, Elise. I really do. I, I just, I, I just, for me, it, it has to keep coming back to like, for instance, as far as I'm concerned, we could have spent 60 minutes just talking about heaven. That's yeah. how big a deal this really is to me. Well, maybe we'll You're have to have to... you come back and we can do a whole episode on heaven. Uh, there you go. Because, because I think we need that. I know I've mentioned this on, on previous podcasts, uh, about my whole idea of heaven was pretty much formulated by this terrible church play that yes. was going around. And and it was like everything, I write about it, in fact, in my upcoming book, Another Gospel, where, it, you know, th there were like these metallic curtains and every, it was so sterile. It felt like a hospital room. And I, and I was scared of being there forever. I didn't really want to do that forever. And so I think you're right. I think a robust understanding, the good theology of heaven is, is one of the most important things every Christian can have that, that we, we are thinking, not as an afterthought, but like you said, this is the main event. It is the main event, and we, we've got to wrap our minds around it. Like, for instance, in my book, Why God Allows Evil, I go through six lies that the devil tells about heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, just heaven will be white. Uh, think about it. Whenever you see heaven portrayed in commercials or movies or what, it's white. Yeah. Uh, it, heaven, if, if heaven's got a color, it's jewel tone. Yeah. Read Revelation uh, that we're not going to know anyone in heaven. That's just simply false. The scripture, in fact, Revelation says, and their deeds will follow them. Uh, it doesn't make sense to talk about, you know, being in the presence of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob if you don't know who they are. Uh, of course, anyway, I'm not going to go through them now, but I, I, I just simply cannot emphasize enough that we need to have a proper view of eternal life in Jesus and how exciting this is going to be, because if we don't, it's going to be like a bummer. I had a, I had a sophomore uh, come up to me one day, a uh, sophomore in college, an undergrad, she comes up and she fought back tears as she confessed to me that she was afraid she didn't want to go to heaven. Yeah. Well, and that's the same thing you said, and I remembered you telling me that when we were yeah. in Tulsa together, and all I can say is that has to change yeah. if people are going to be not be afraid of their death, because if you think heaven's going to be a cosmic bummer, well, who wants to go to heaven if it's going to be a cosmic bummer? But anyway, but it's not. You're yeah. going to reign forever and ever and ever with Jesus. Yes. And like I say, heaven's most often compared to a banquet. Yes, yes. That's a good word, good stuff. I used to think it was, you know, like the lesser of two evils. Either you burn forever or you're doing an uh, eternal worship service, which I couldn't yeah. tell which was worse at the time. <laughs> so anyway. No, it's right. It's true. Yeah. Well, Clay, thank you so much for being on the show today. We'll definitely have you back to talk more about heaven. I think that would be a great episode, so we'll get that planned. If you're watching, get Clay's book, Immortal, How the Fear of Death Drives Us and What We Can Do About It. I'll put links to that in the podcast notes and on the YouTube uh, description as well. Clay, thank you so much for, for coming on and being with us today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure as always to be with you, Elisa. Hey, thanks so much for joining us today. And if you want to be notified every time we release a new video, be sure and subscribe on YouTube and click the bell icon for notifications. You can also subscribe on iTunes. And if you're listening on iTunes, we'd sure appreciate you leaving a five-star review. If you think you might be interested in exclusive bonus content, early access to posts and free gifts, go to patreon.com slash Alisa Childers to learn more about how to come alongside us in a deeper way. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.